Do we? No, not yet. This is just us. OK, good, because I need to find the worksheet. You got your worksheet, Grant? You good? Yeah, I got, I got it. Oh, OK. Something's happening. Come on. Cool. We're good. We're live. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, as, as per usual, we're going to let people flow in. So sit tight, open your champagne, uh, play a game guessing what Grant's virtual background is. You get points if you can guess it. Um, and then we'll get started just in a minute or two here. And we'll also make sure everybody has worksheets and all the other important assets for school. Um, which today, if you don't know, is Champagne Day. Why is it Champagne Day? Well, because our friend Cedric, it's his birthday today. Happy birthday, Cedric. Um, Thanks, guys. Our pleasure. And this is the first time you can see Cedric. We finally decided it was time to release him, to let him be seen and known to the public. I feel good about that decision. Sweet. So we'll give it a couple more minutes um, as everybody kind of files in here, but getting close to getting started. I'm looking. And we will, as per usual, if this is your first one, so we always have a worksheet that goes along with the class. Today's champagne. We'll share the worksheet in the um, Q and A section, and I think we'll try to do it in the chat as well. If you look on Zoom below you, you'll see the Q and A section and the chat section. Um, the Q&A is where we usually do most of the back and forth. So Cedric, um, our good friend and uh, wonderful wine professional from 11 Mattis Park and now working with Grant Parcell, he's going to jump in and answer questions that we don't tackle in the chat um, you know, on this Q&A side. So please um, jump in here. OK, chat's disabled. So let's do it all in the Q&A. I think that was purposeful. Um, and then, like I said, Cedric will answer questions. We'll, we'll cover the topics at hand and try to get to things um, that are kind of like on topic as we chat. But feel free to ask questions about anything, and then we'll answer them as we go. And hopefully it's all, all a very educational and uh, at least mildly entertaining hour as we talk about champagne. So just a couple more minutes, and then we will uh, get started here. Um, can somebody on our side drop the worksheet in the Q&A or in the chat? I can probably do it as well, but. Sweet. What's up, Chris? What's up? Hold on, I'm just making sure we get our, our worksheet in here. We're getting our act together, folks. For... Cool. But... All right. I feel like we're ready. Are you ready, Grant? I'm ready now. Awesome. All right. So like I said, today is a very big day uh, for us, not only because it's our friend Cedric's birthday, which it is. So please wish him a happy birthday. But today our book came out, How to Drink Wine. It always does this to me on the background, but you can see it on Grant's uh, wallpaper there. If you haven't ordered it, please do. But if you have, thank you so much. Hopefully it's arriving. Um, obviously shipping is a little bit different than we had anticipated right now. But if you don't have it yet and you pre-ordered it, it should be there soon, hopefully. And please feel free to uh, review it, give it very good ratings or very bad ratings on Amazon, whatever you're motivated to do, we'll take it all. But um, really appreciate all of you who have supported us and bought the book and, uh, and joined us for now, I guess, what is eight straight weeks of wine school. Um, and today we felt like it was appropriate because we're celebrating, we're gonna talk about champagne, um, and, uh, and answer questions about champagne. It should be, uh, I would imagine, one of the more popular and engaging topics that we've covered, especially judging by the amount of people we have this week. So um, like I said, there's a worksheet. And again, if you haven't done one of these with us before, we try to sort of keep this structured so you can see where we're going and you know the order of things that we're gonna tackle. Um, we'll try to stay organized and try to stay on topic here, but I'll, ask questions about anything. There's nothing that's off limits. Um, you'll see the worksheets in there now too in the chat. So click on that, uh, follow along. Hopefully you're drinking some champagne um, and we'll, uh, we'll get into it. So Grant, 
Where do we want to start? This picture behind me actually is a picture I took with Grant when we were in Champaign in like the middle of January one year, extremely hungover. And that was like leaning out of a car window. Um, but early, early, early in the morning as we were trying to get back to Paris. But Champagne's cool because it's close to Paris. It's a great place to visit. Obviously, we've all drank it. I think there's a lot more to talk about than probably, um, you know, uh, meets the eye. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in Champagne and um, and clearly lots to talk about. So the interesting thing is in this situation is going to be talking about the important stuff, which is how Champagne is made without getting too into the weeds and making this too scientific, but it's important. So let's kick off. Um, and again, you can follow along on the worksheet as we go. And Grant, what do you want to talk about? Let's let's get into this. Let's, let's start with first. <clears throat> so everybody's probably had some sparkling wine at some point, or uh, it was probably called champagne, right? At a wedding or I don't know, whatever, wherever you know we uh, tend to be in term times of celebration. But the I think the 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 first thing that we have to understand about champagne is that it's a place. It's a cold and kind of dreary looking place, especially in January where, where Chris is hanging out. But um, the difference between champagne and say like Prosecco or Cava, et cetera, is that champagne has to come from this really special part of France that's, that's just north of Paris as, as Chris was saying. So if it says champagne on the label, right, then it must be from this area. And that's really important because sparkling wine or you know as we may just like loosely call it champagne is made everywhere right so it's made i don't know from new york to italy australia whatever and they make it with a whole bunch of different grapes um and they they make it in a lot of different styles so champagne i think consistently has a really unique flavor because of where it's from and then also how they make it which can get pretty geeky but we'll get into that um a little bit to begin with. So um, Champagne as a place, it's kind of interesting. So Champagne, think of it like, I don't know, it's a it's probably like a hundred miles long. Um, Cedric could maybe uh, be more exact on that, but it's really like pretty flat. You drive around, it, it doesn't necessarily look as dramatic as, as a place like Burgundy or some of the other regions that we were talking about. Um, but the reason why it makes the wines in, you know, kind of taste the way in which it do is because it's really cold there. And historically speaking, the wines couldn't get like ripe enough. They couldn't get enough alcohol in them to drink as still wines. So they had to come up with this method in order to create something that was- Very cold. I'm demonstrating yeah. coldness, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> that was, um, you know, drinkable. So if like, I think we tasted it when we were there, but if you taste champagne before it goes through the champagne process, which makes it sparkling and it's just like still wine, then it's actually, it's pretty terrible. It's really, really tart. It really tastes like lemon juice and it, and it's just not something that anybody would want to drink. So what they Real do quick, before really fast, I just uh, want to like show people where it is instead of just doing the Google map today, I'm going to actually use the book here. So hold on while I get rid of my yeah, background so you can see it. Uh, um, by the way, champagne in this book is like one of the, I think, um, biggest parts of the book, right? So you can kind of see it right there. Um, there geographically. So I'm going to try and use, by the way, the book as much as possible today because it's out and we can actually show people now. Um, <laughs> as we go along and really quickly too, I want to make sure, cause we forgot to call out in the beginning, but um, there are a bunch of people joining us from a bunch of local bookstores today. And before we get too deep into it, I just want to say thank you to all of them. And you'll see in the chat, uh, there's a link on, uh, you know, where you can go sort of, or we'll make sure there's a link up there where you can sort of um, support local bookstores as we go. So um, oh, yeah. just want to call that out, but I'm going to, I'm going to follow along with you while we're talking through this, just so we can sort of demonstrate how this is all displayed in our fancy little book here. Sorry, go ahead. No, we're good, man. So <clears throat> there's a place that naturally would make really terrible wine. And so they came up with this method to where <clears throat> they put a little bit of um, sugar, right, which is what turns into alcohol, back into the bottle. 
and then yeast, which is what, you know, combined with sugar makes alcohol. <clears throat> and then they put a cap on it. And so if you've ever, I don't know, if you've ever had like orange juice hanging out in your fridge for too long, um, and it, you, you open it up and it's all like sparkling or, or even worse, it, it would explode. It's the same thing, right? So carbonation comes, that's how they make like hooch or, or really, if you're in really desperate times and you need to make your own alcohol, you can just let some OJ ferment into, into something. You're probably gonna get sick, but the, uh, at least it'll be sparkling. So <clears throat> what happens is they take a normal wine, there's a little bit of sugar, that can goes back into the wine and then yeast, which chews up the sugar to make alcohol, put a top on it, right? And then it turns sparkling. What also happens is that it will get higher in alcohol a little bit. And sometimes in certain wines, there's a little bit of like sugar that's left over. So it balances out how sweet, or sorry, how, how uh, tart the wine would be if it, if it didn't go through that process, right? So in short, that's the champagne process. You make a wine, put some more sugar and some yeast in it. You put the cork back in it, right? <laughs> and then the yeast and the sugar start to eat each other up. Carbonation happens. And also the flavor of the wine changes inherently. Does that make sense, Chris? Very scientific. But I think the key, Super scientific. Yeah. The, key the key, I think, that's, I, that's sometimes I think probably most important well, it's most important, but sometimes the most confusing is how that's different. Like, why is that different mm -hmm. than Prosecco? Or why is that different than something else? Because champagne is a place, but it's also a process. Exactly. So the reason why that's different is that you can also just like, I don't know, if like like the same way that people, so my dad's calling me to say congrats real quick. Um, <laughs> the same way that, that like a soda stream, right? You can just pump carbonation into it. Um, that happens too with, with certain wines, which is a really like quick and easy way to be able to do it. That's how they make Prosecco. They pretty much just like inject it um, with it. There's other regions that kind of do this method um, as well. But the thing is, is it takes a really long time to be able to do it. Um, it's super labor intensive. And so therefore the wines like tend to, you know, have more of a cost to them and therefore the price goes up. But the thing that makes champagne different is that they have this like style of, of making it. And then what they do is they age the wine for a long period of time. And that's, uh, can you guys see Cedric? So, yeah, we can see. Yeah, so that's like champagne aging in the bottle. And then this flavor, if, if you're all drinking it, when you taste this kind of like nutty, almost like bread kind of buttery flavor to it, um, those are flavors that come through the aging process. Exactly. So when you go to champagne, you go downstairs in the cellars and just load it up with bottles that are hanging out um, on their side, aging, and therefore the flavor is changing uh, for, for, you know, up to, I don't know, five years, even longer. So when hand turn the bottles and it's very like, it's very manual yeah. process. It's very manual process. Um, and then there's some that like, will be aged in this way for, I don't know, like Dom Perignon makes, makes a line to where they can be aged for like 10, 15, 20 years um, in this way before they're like sold and released. So Champagne tastes the way it does because of where it's from, right? Which is a really cold area. And then through this really pretty technical process of, of uh, aging the wine on what's called the like dead yeast, which, which is called lees, that really, really gives it this extra flavor to it. So all of that, like being said at the, at, at the end of the day, it's, you know, a combination of all these things that makes it really unique and really distinct from any sparkling wine anywhere else in the world. There's like a couple regions that have sort of been like, cool, we have the same climate. We're gonna do the same exact thing. There's French Accorda in Italy that had a little bit of hype. The wines are really expensive. They're just not really as good. Um, they, and but they, use this, they use the same process, essentially. Same process, same process, similar grapes, same grapes, uh, et cetera, to be able to do it, but it, it really just doesn't work out. So I think really, you know, unlike anywhere else, this, uh, this process is really, really unique to this region. 
and it's just what they've been doing forever. So, you know, a few hundred years into it, uh, they start to figure it out. Cool. So that's how it's made, right? Which is which I think is is uh, important, and and the process is called like the champagne process, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the most important thing to rem just because I think so broadly people think of sparkling wine and champagne is the same thing. So I think that's the most important thing for people to really sort of take out of this. Is just, it's, it's first of all, I mean, we were joking when we wrote the book, we had, I think, a whole chapter that was, I mean, mostly just because we're sarcastic idiots, but there was like a whole chapter we were originally going to title Champagne is my favorite grape just to sort of try and like, you know, make the point that that's, yeah. that's, that it's not a grape, but it's also, I think, you know, it's just super important to know that it's different than sparkling wine, which is actually a really big category. Um, and there's so much of it made in so many different ways. So um, I think that's what, yeah, people question too, right? They're like, why is it, why is champagne so much more expensive or um, what's so special about it is, <clears throat> is that it's like, it takes a ton of time um, and it really can only work out in this, this one particular part of the world um, as we know it. You know, there's like some people, I don't know if anybody's asked this, but for a little while, people became really obsessed with sparkling wine from uh, England because it's really close to champagne and has the same sort of soil types. Um, I've yet to be convinced that like it has the same you know, kind of quality, but um, maybe it would. And, and, you know, God save the queen. That's what they'll be drinking. But uh, I don't know. There's really nowhere else in the world that I think really can uh can make can make sparkling wine in the same way that champagne does uh there's a bunch of questions about like glassware and stuff which we'll get to yeah. but, um, somebody asked a question about during the process uh they had heard that um some of the bottles would be open to remove sediment is that true yeah so that's a, what we were talking about so um you have i just kind of skipped over that but so what we we're talking about is when the, these bottles are aging right so the sugar and the yeast are hanging out in there. The sugar eats all the yeast, turns into alcohol and carbonation, right? And then what's left over is dead yeast cells, which is the sediment that they're referring to. Um, and those dead yeast cells give it all of that like nutty kind of creamy flavor. And so what they do in order to get it out, so you're not like pouring a glass of champagne with a bunch of floaters in it, is that, um... what's up, is that you, uh, um, they do this thing, it's called disgorgement. And it's this like, I don't know, pretty crazy process of where they can either do it like underwater and all the solids come out, but the bottle, but the, the liquid stays in because of the vacuum underwater. Um, or they can like freeze the neck and then they pop it off and out goes a cork and all the, all the sediment in there too. But yeah, that's- uh, The key is to do all of that without affecting the wine with air and everything else that can happen, right? Yeah, definitely. So then what they do is they'll do that, right? And then they put a, the actual cork on it and that's what we get. So it's it's definitely like a, a three, four step process um, before we get the wines. It said like on, on the bottle, you see back in the day, why they have these like long, um, what would you call this? The foil tops here longer than like a normal bottle is because um, it was meant to like cover up the wine that would be missing from the bottle otherwise, but they just top it up with, with wine nowadays. So uh, fun little fact there on wine. Neck. Good factoid. Great fact. Yeah. Um, well, all right, so let's, let's get into the grapes a little bit. Cause I think this is actually oh. where it gets, it's super interesting. And, and I think we're so much of the, you know, the variation and the discovery happens as you start to get into it. So three grapes, <laughs> um they kind of make up champagne yeah so um champagne can be it can be made from like seven different grapes four of which nobody cares about and and you know the names are really insignificant meaning that you would never see it really on a label and then there's the three main grapes two of which we're familiar with chardonnay and pinot noir and then a third one which really has become super important i think in the last 10 or so years um, called Pinot Meunier, uh, which is really, I, th I think probably only grown in Champagne, might be planted in some other places randomly, but it's a grape really unique to the area. And so what you see is you can have, a producer can make a choice, right? And what they can do is they can blend 
two of the grapes in any proportion that they want. They can blend all three of the grapes. They can blend, you know, all seven of the grapes, but again, you don't really see that. Um, or they can make a wine, they can make a champagne with only one of the grapes, right? So the one that we're drinking tonight says Blanc de Blanc on it. And if it says Blanc de Blanc, so I'll throw that up in the chat, is um, Blanc de Blancs is you know, we had in the chat section not the q a because there's kind of two things going on but it's all good all right whatever but blanc to blanc is uh it means if you see that on label it means it's from 100 percent chardonnay and then you can also see blanc de noir on a label and that means it's either 100 percent pinot meunier or pinot noir so if you see like blanc de anything noir or blanc that means it's made from from one grape and why that's important is because Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, you can imagine, right? You're thinking like, oh, wow, I, I didn't know that a red grape could be used in Champagne. But yeah, they have really, really, really different flavors, right? So Chardonnay, Blanc de Blanc will make Champagne that is like better for drinking earlier in the night. It's really crisp. It's really light. It's really refreshing. And then Blanc de Noir makes a much like richer style of Champagne, Pinot uh, just gives it kind of a denser and fruitier flavor. And then Pinot Meunier, there's, there's not a ton of like examples of it by itself, but most of the like great champagnes out there have some of it sprinkled in there. I think Pinot Meunier is really like savory and kind of salty. It has sort of a unique flavor to it. Um, and yeah, now more and more you're seeing a lot of attention on, on that as a grape. It's a pretty geeky thing, but if, if especially in like natural wine world and some yeah. other areas, it's it's definitely become um, pretty popular. And it's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think, I think it's good to just sort of think about though, like a little bit, maybe talk a little bit more about some of the, the difference in taste, right? Because yeah. It's pretty important, but um, especially as you do start to see them like more, you know, with with the three of them being more individualized, right? Like, why don't you talk a little bit more just about the differences and even if you you know as they get blended how those that the flavors and tastes are affected definitely so what you see is that um so we'll, we'll use like a producer um i don't know like like krug blends all three grapes into it and if you're uh which is a uh, i think a, a really well-known producer it's really well distributed the wines certainly aren't cheap it's definitely like a luxury blend uh brand but what you'll see is that they'll blend like all three of those together in different proportions every year to try to balance it out, right? And it's kind of like, um, I don't know, you're just like creating a recipe at the end of the day. Because Krug is, people know what it tastes like and their goal is to have people every year drink the wine and have it be like the signature Krug flavor. And be consistent. And be consistent, exactly. So we'll talk about this like multi vintage versus vintage thing in a little bit. But what happens is that the proportions of Chardonnay versus Pinot Noir versus Pinot Meunier can change every year because they offer so many different like kind of flavors to it. So Chardonnay is what gives it like the refreshing kind of crisp thing. Pinot Noir is what gives it like body and makes it full and kind of fruity. <laughs> And then Pinot Meunier makes it sort of, again, like salty and um, like gives it that kind of wet rock type thing, which is really prominent. Um, if you've ever licked rocks, it's a real thing. Actually, but <laughs> one of your favorite things. But um, so together, the, the three grapes are really different. And so what you'll see often is that people will blend them to create a wine that has like a little bit more harmony or just to try to achieve a, a certain style. But um, yeah, I don't know, does, does that answer that? So I think if you're looking for champagne, that's like, you want something that's super crisp and really light, then stick to ones that are all Chardonnay or, or dominant Chardonnay, and you'll find that if it's Blanc de Blanc. If you want something that's like really rich and, and kind of fruity and, and uh, I don't know, just, just a bigger, almost sweeter type wine, look for Blanc de Noir, which is uh, Pinot Noir heavy. I really like the one that, we put in the six pack is uh, Blanc de Blanc, which is definitely my favorite style uh, just because it's so easy to drink. Yeah, mine too. 
What about the um the like bready brioche stuff? Because like especially the grower champagnes, I always notice that some of them it's like a straight up like donut in your nose. A little bakery. Situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of that happens from the uh, the aging on the bottle, right? Yeah. So said like the longer that it ages um, on those like dead yeast cells that you know get spit out as sediment is you get a lot of that like bready brioche thing to it. Um, there's also a thing that like before the wine goes into the bottle and age, they, there's a bunch of little decisions that a winemaker can make. Um, like we went, the two areas we went, we went to one producer, right? Pierre Peters that makes like a really crisp, really clean style. They age mostly in stainless steel or in cement before it goes in versus Barash, which ages more so in like oak barrels and things like that, which will definitely change kind of the overall flavor of the wine. Um, but yeah, I think that's like a signature of champagne. And sometimes it can get a little extreme to where, you know, it can be like really, really yeah, powerful. I mean, sometimes it's like so intense that I hate it, but it's, not, it's, it's like very, to me, it's like a, a very fine line where at a certain point that bready taste is amazing. And then if it crosses that line, it's disgusting, at least definitely. to me. I think you guys should probably some, you know, um, you get some of that in this one, but yeah, the yeah. disgusting thing can be a little, can be a little gnarly and you'll see it in the color. Like this is really, this looks like white wine with uh, some of the ones that, that are like aged a little bit longer, or maybe they age them in, uh, in like oak barrels or, you know, expose them to oxygen more. They'll be really dark in color. They'll be um, almost like brown in effect. Yeah, which definitely is is a different thing. But I don't know. I don't like, you know, champagne is is something that if I'm having a big dinner, um, I'll like have a glass of or are you waiting for someone? Right. But a lot of those like bigger styles of champagne, um, they're just not they're not necessarily as refreshing as, as you want. Yeah, be. I love it every once in a while, but I'm definitely someone who's going to drink a Blanc Blanc more often. Um, it's like one thing just to point out. What's that? Uh, it's like, think of it as like having like a light Pilsner type thing. Yeah. Or going to like a triple IPA, big alcohol so, situation, beer. Like a sweet, sweet, yeah. cold Tecate. Exactly. Um, one one quick ba basic question that, that is a good question because it, it, you know, it's it's not necessarily obvious all the time, but um, somebody here asked what, how do you make a white wine out of a red grape, meaning Pinot Noir? Um, and it's really just when you think about what color is a grape when you take the skin off, it's white. Uh, so the wines are just made without the skin. So that's, but it's funny because a lot of people don't intuitively think about that. So it's not a, not a bad question at all. Um, let's definitely talk because there's a lot of questions about aging and vintages. And then um, somebody asked a good question that I don't think we tackle on the worksheet in terms of you know, the range from, you know, dosage through brute and ultra brute and extra brute. So let's, let's hit both of those things in whatever order you want to. Okay, sweet. Um, let's hit the like brute situation. So um, there's a whole like range and what that has to do ultimately with is um, the amount of like dosage, which gets put back into uh, into the wines. Um, sure. And so the dosage level is the amount of sugar. It's called liqueur de dosage, which is, is pretty much, it's like a really sweet wine in which you can do different scales of it. And what it does is, is as that like ferments out, um, it, you know, will change the characteristic of the wine, right? And so if there's more sugar added to it, that won't all ferment to be totally dry. And the wine, therefore, at the end will be sweeter, right? And so there's a whole bunch of different levels of that. Um, nowadays, you tend to only see like Brut. Um, you also see Brut Nature, which means that there was uh, no sugar uh, added back into it. And so it's just like fermented totally, totally dry. Some of those wines can be really, really, really tart. They have like a lot of acidity to it. Um, I, what's that? Those are wild wines. Some they're wild are, wines. You drink are drinking, like, so weird. They're so weird. That's really only like been possible with climate change. I feel like we throw that out there all the time, but it's real. It's like 
uh, Brut Natur back in the day, the ones they literally like when you're in champagne tasting, your teeth can hurt because there's so much acidity in the stuff. But um, Brut is the same thing. It's like the lemonade analogy is that a little bit of sugar, a little bit of tartness create something that is in balance, right? And so it can, there's a spectrum of it. Whereas like Brut Natur, and then you can have, there's, I don't think anybody really makes them anymore, um, but you can have like actually like champagne that's actually like a, a, a sweet wine. But I would say no, nowadays no. those terms, you can kind of ignore them um, because the, the like levels of sugar that they represent are so small. And you tend to just see like, brute being the like common uh you know the common thing so if uh if you see really anything other than brute then i don't know it's it's a little bit different but just go for brute that's like the traditional style of champagne if you want to try something a little bit different that's um definitely have has you know some some stamina with it i would say is the the brute nature wines um are pretty interesting and a lot of like the younger generation of, of winemakers out there making those wines because it's super natural um, in the process. Yeah, but it's interestingly though, the, the, you know, the old school way, like back in the day in France, they drank them pretty sweet. Yeah, people just liked sweet stuff more so than we do now. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the last time you like actually had a glass of port or Madeira, um, but people used to crush that stuff. That was like the main wine that people drink. And nowadays nobody really cares. Right. And so I think our tastes, um, we like things that are much less sweet than, than in the past. And we'll get some, there's some questions in here about natural stuff, which we'll definitely um, hit as well. But I want to talk about the aging part because um, I think that's, it's so unique for champagne, um, the way we talk about vintage and non vintage. Okay. So talk about that. Yeah. yeah. So um, Pet Nat, we got that in there too. We'll get there. Uh, then we'll get there. Um, so yeah, so there's, this is important. And this is definitely a distinction with in Champagne um, is that there can be wines like, so, so the one that we're, we're drinking doesn't have like a, a year listed on the front of it, right? Um, and then there can be wines that, that do have a year listed. So I think probably the most current like vintage of, uh, of Champagne that you would see out right now it's probably like 2012 um i doubt you would see anything younger than that um maybe i don't know said if you've seen anything like from 13 but or 15 15 2015 would probably be the next but what it is is that in really great years um historically they would put the vintage on it and that would mean that the wine had to be from that year specifically, just like any other wine, right? So just like Burgundy or just like Bordeaux, you see the year on it. That means the grapes were hundred percent from that year. Well, Champagne for a few different reasons, but because like we were saying, the weather is so extreme, it's so cold, so hard to make wine there. What they did is they would take, what, what pretty much what they would do is they, they would take wine, put it in the barrels, store it right year after year and it kind of like built up on itself but they would store it so 2000 we'll start in 2000 right like 2000 2001 2002 2003 there's four different years right all of those years have a really different flavor to them one might be like higher in alcohol one might, might be more crisp one might be fruitier um, and then one might just be terrible like you just lost everything. Like in 2001, there's a whole bunch of hail there. And so what they would do is they would blend, they put like kind of keep, it's almost like just like filling the pot back up um, as you pour, pour something out is that they would just create this like perpetual growing giant pot of wine that that's called a Solera system. That's really simplifying the Solera system. Like a big sourdough starter. Exactly. You're just always constantly <laughs> feeding it. Definitely. And then what they would do is what we were talking about, right, is where they would take the wine and then add sugar and yeast to make it sparkling. Then once that happens, then it turns into champagne. So if you see a wine that doesn't have a year on it, that means it's a blend of several different vintages, 
right? And so um, that is something that's really important because with certain producers, they might have this blend, this blend of like different vintages might stretch like 20 vintages, right? Of just constantly, you know, keeping this thing going. And what happens is like over 20 years, it all kind of ends up tasting the same, which is what they want to try to achieve. So for a long time, you wouldn't really associate like a vintage with champagne, but you would just associate like, hey, I know that no matter what, if I buy this bottle of, uh, I don't know, whatever, buy this bottle of Veuve Clicquot, throw it out there, you're doing something wrong, but it's going to taste the same every single year, year after year. Okay. So the idea is that no matter what you buy that bottle, it's always going to taste the same. So that's multi vintage. Nowadays, weather has changed again. Um, you're starting to see, and people want like, and, and we really see this a lot with like the smaller producers is people want um, wines that taste a little bit different, even year in, year out. And so there's some producers that won't do this blending at all, right? One, because it takes a lot of time to do. And if you're a younger winemaker, you're just starting up. You're like, cool, I just got to make my wine. I got to get it out the door. I got to sell it, right? We're not going to like sit on something. Um, then it'll have a vintage label on it. Um, or there might be something like really discreet in the back that'll tell you what year it's from. And the, uh, the, the, the thing with that is that if it has like the label on it, the, the vintage on it is just means that legally they've had to age it a long, longer period of time. And it's something that, you know, um, in theory is a better quality, right? So you don't really see that. Like you don't see that with white wine. You don't see that with red wine really anywhere. This idea of blending stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, usually the vintage is very important to give you a sense for, you know, the quality based on that year, but it's so unique in that there is this giant sort of starting point that some of these guys use for each 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 year so yeah exactly and there's some producers there's like this really fancy producer producer called salon and salon is only made in like the absolutely best years then they just don't make the wine in the other years um it'll go into a totally different champagne uh with a different label on it that's made in a much much larger quantity they'll they'll kind of um, just put it into a different a different thing um, so it's definitely an important thing but you'll see like multi vintage you see this on restaurant wine lists a lot like mv or nv um, that just means that it's not vintage specific uh, and and you'll also see like a specific year on it um cool and before so we'll talk about producers because that's the next big chunk um as you'll see in the worksheet and it's, you know, important here because there's so many familiar names and then a lot of new stuff that's popping up. And then we'll, we'll end by getting into some of the other stuff that doesn't either fit directly into champagne, you know, like some of these other sparkling wines and things like that. But um, there are some, some good questions I want to answer before we move on, which is a couple of questions about like differentiation within champagne, right? So either soils that might, change the way that Chardonnay tastes from one part of Champagne to another, or even just differentiation from town to town, right? Because there's a few yeah. towns, important towns in Epernay. So um, it's a small area, but there is some differentiation, right? And I, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, a lot of that has to do with like the soil, right? And then therefore the grapes. So there's certain towns. Um, there's one town called Menil, which you'll see on a label. Right. Um, I don't know how to answer in the questions, but M-E-S-N-I-L. Uh, Menil is like all about Chardonnay. Uh, and there's other towns that'll be all about Pinot Noir, right? And so the town um, can tell you sort of what the grape is if it's if you also see Blanc de Blanc um, on it. And the reason for that is that um, there's like, this is the, the England reference, but there's these big cliffs in England and Dover that are totally white. They're like chalk. And that same soil type like comes down into to France. Um, and then you could, so where the soil can like be actually white, it's crazy. You're walking on it and it looks like white sand with like weeds popping up through it. Yeah, geographically, those two places are close together. They're just separated by an English channel, but otherwise you're talking pretty same much the deal. same part of the world. And even in Champagne, you can find like, it's crazy, you find like fossils of, seashells and th 
things like that, right? Because once upon a time it was all underwater. And so the um, difference is, is that the soils, depending on the erosion of it all, um, will have either like clay um, or they might have more of this like chalky soil, right? And so um, that soil, it's not just like a little chunk, but it'll be across like a whole hill or across a whole town. And so the town, it has different soil and then the hills are oriented in a different direction because it's such like a big area. It's not just like one stack of vineyards like you have in Burgundy. Is that the town will really have um, kind of a, a, a common like grape that'll be associated with it. Um, and that's, that's a big part of like why you would see different towns on them. For a lot of the big producers, it's a little bit of like a marketing play because they, they will like, they don't, uh, they'll source grapes from all over the place. Oh, yeah. Right. And then they'll like throw Epernay on the label just cause that's like the deluxe kind of spot, but the fruit might, doesn't necessarily all have to be from Epernay, but the producer is just based there, uh, kind of based in, based in the main town there. And there's not a lot of elevation variation in the area, right? Like no. so much. All kind of look like that. It's really yeah. I mean, that's why that's why I actually chose this back. For if you if you've been to some of the other ones, right? Like, this is like usually what our my background looks like. It's like some like warm, green, beautiful place. But I actually took this photo and just thought it was a good demonstration because so much of Champagne is about how cold it is, right? Um, and uh, and there's not as much of that sort of elevation. And I guess you know the sun doesn't play as much of a role at least as it might in Tuscany. But um, yeah. And that's, I think, too, why, because, you know, we do talk about it a lot, but climate change in this area is pretty important because as it warms up, it's going to change things for sure. Definitely. It's, yeah, it's not like, I don't know, <laughs> when, like, driving around, it's not necessarily the sexiest place. It looks like, it's like, kind of like the Iowa of, of, uh, <laughs> of <France. laughs> wine regions. <laughs> like, there's, they're like big farm looking vineyards, right, yeah. at the end of the day. Um even there's some like really special vineyards in that town, like Menil, and you're there and you're like, all right, this is, this is like the one that costs five times as much as the other one. The one that blew me away, we actually went, so Grant and I went with um, Pierre Peters, a producer we'll talk about in a second, to one of his like most prized vineyards. And your friend Clark took a picture of it. I was looking for it, but <laughs> it's literally like on this like street corner. And yeah. it's not it's not beautiful at all. It's just this weird street corner in this town in Champagne. And I thought that was And he's hyped. Fun. It's like yeah, super it's big deal, man. And the wines are great. But it's yeah. it's it's uh yeah, it's a different thing. So I think uh -huh. um the towns are the towns are important, uh, but that's that's definitely like level three if you're if you're geeking out on it. I would say producer is the most important thing in Champagne because there's so many variables. Whereas like in Burgundy or in these other regions, they really can't like tweak with the recipe as much, right? They have to age it for a certain amount of time. They're like demanded, you know, to have the same grape on it. But where Champagne is, these guys can all be like really experimental, um, which is something that you're seeing more and more now, which I think we threw in there is like the grower Champagne or kind of smaller producer thing uh, that, that that's going on. One, those wines offer a lot of really great value but also they offer a whole different like taste and a whole different uh, experience of, of champagne. Yeah. They open so it up. Let's talk a little about that. Cause I think champagne is also really unique just because there's so many big brands that we all know. Right. And more mm -hmm. so than any other, like that doesn't really exist in wine otherwise, except for maybe like the grocery store wine brands. But, um, and you know, some of these are, you know, centuries old champagne houses. And that's why they're so well known as they've been making it for a long time. And I actually, I remember learning this and thought it was so interesting that just that the reason you talk about them as grower champagnes versus the other ones is that typically those growers weren't making their own wines. They were just selling them to the bigger houses, right? So now you have a trend where, you know, these smaller guys are starting to make their own wines and they're really good. So um, you want to just sort of maybe talk a little bit about the difference and, um, you know, I think you'll see, and certainly as we've you know, see in the chat and we've talked about it, like there's lots of great wines from big producers, but there's also great, really interesting stuff happening now from the smaller guys too. Yeah, I think that's it. It's like, I, somebody threw it in there. It's, um, the Vouv thing, sorry, it's just like, I don't know, it's just a, I'm just kind of messing around. But 
um, at the end of the day, there's a lot of great wine like Dom Perignon, um, Krug, Cristal. Those are all amazing wines and they're super age worthy. And I think they're great, right? And we sell them at our shop, we sell them at our restaurants, et cetera. But what happened is like at, the, the, at some point, right? There was only like a few, there was almost like a monopoly of these really big, big wineries. And they became really pow powerful. They make a ton of wine. They make, I think, you know, if there's any like big company, big winery um, success, like anywhere in the world, it pretty much only exists in Champagne. And so a lot of those, those big brands just make great wine um, at the end of the day. And I'll go out there and, and totally endorse that. But what happened is, is I think as, you know, we all became more interested in, in wine and wine, uh, you know, was like just consumed from, or champagne in particular, from different like demographics, different people, people were looking for different price points or different experiences, is that it gave room for the people, for the farmers, right? And this is why it's called like grower champagne. And so they were the farmers that would supply the grapes to these big houses. And what they decided, and this kind of happened everywhere, it happened in Burgundy, it happened in Barolo, it happened everywhere, is that at some point the farmers are like, shit, I, I want to make wine too. I just don't want to grow grapes, right? And then they start doing their own thing. They realize they're pretty good at it. There's a good like market for new brands, for people you know, just wind, wanting to try new things. And then this whole like movement pops off, right? Um, and so that's like what happened in Champagne, but I think Champagne is the most recent area for, for that to have happened. Uh, it happened in Burgundy in like the 50s and 60s. Um, it happened in Barolo, kind of around the same time, like 70s and 80s, you start to see producers who, who were probably growing grapes and selling them off to the co-op doing their, doing their own thing there. Um, but that's not to say that like some of these wines, you know, you have, uh, you have Dom Perignon, you have like Cristal, you have Bollinger, you have Tattinger, all these like historic estates. The wines are really good. And uh, yeah, they're all. I think, I think what's so interesting about it and why, look, I think why champagne is interesting to people, but also why that's, that topic is interesting is because it really like, it's such big brand names that everybody's familiar with. And that's just, yeah. that's what's so unique about it, right? Is that there are some great, you know, very well-known Bordeaux producers, but not to the extent that, you know, the whole population who's not even all that familiar with wine will know some of these brands and some of these labels. So I think that's what's been um, kind of unique about, about the region all in all. But, um, but there's some questions in here that I think are worth answering too, though, because it does to your, you know, as we, somebody asked about pet mats and things like that, like this, the sparkling category is also one that's been pretty interesting in terms of the way the natural wine world has evolved around it, right? So you, we should talk a little bit about, you know, pet nats and about some of the other, like, you know, whether it's um, Cremant or just some of the other things that people will see out there that aren't necessarily champagne, but, you know, are similar. And, uh, and we'll, we'll answer some of these other questions related to champagne towards the end here. I just want to get to that before we do that. Definitely. So pet nat, pet nat's kind of, it's a whole different thing. It's a different process in making the, the champagne. So uh, what they'll do is they'll take the wine. So champagne, like we said, is like they make wine and then they add sugar and yeast to it. Pet nat, what they do is like before the wine is totally done fermenting, right? Into like a normal dry wine, they'll put it in a bottle and they'll put, put a top on it. Yeah, they'll put a cork in it or that you see a lot with like a, just like a beer top on it, yeah. right? And so what happens <clears throat> is that um, that just like pet nat just means like naturally sparkling, right? And so what they do is they just like pop it on there. And that's why pet nats are cloudy is because you have um, some of that like leftover yeast in there as well. But what happens is, is that the wines aren't really aged for as long of a time. They're normally drunk really young. So what you get is like a sparkling wine that's really fruity and really floral and really fresh. Um, and also, you know, therefore like pretty tasty uh, as well. And, and I think they offer like a lot of good value because it's not aged for as long of a time. So the wines are much less expensive. So Pet Nat is like a whole different process. And that's why you can get 
pet gnat um, from a whole bunch of you know random places in the world um a friend and of also ours. there's like there's like no consistency to it right because they half the time they don't yeah, even know what the you could do you can make like pet nut cabernet if you wanted to there you know whatever you can just do it and and it can be from anywhere um which people are excited about so and i think that's why somebody asked about sort of quote unquote millennial trends with this stuff and i think that's a big one right it's just the ability to buy something for a reasonable price and it's fun and it's interesting and it might who knows where it comes from so it can be really any grape it definitely doesn't fit into the champagne you know because it's not from champagne it's not the process but um it's interesting sparkling wine that people like and you'll see a lot of it out there right now for sure yeah um, um and then let's just touch on cremant and and then i think we can answer some of these last questions because there's a bunch of kind of random but important things i want to answer before we finish yeah definitely i'm looking at the at the questions here too uh, One's Marie Antoinette, which we, we need another hour. So I'll please hang around for that. Real quick on the Grognier. Grognier is a, a small producer. It's more in the uh, grower. It is a grower champagne. It's all from Chardonnay. They're all organic grapes. They definitely make a style that's like meant to be really crisp and, and easy drinking. Um, it's not like aged in new oak barrels or anything like that. It's really meant to be um, super salty and, and uh, delicious. Um, I just got a love squad, uh, how to drink wine from parcels delivered through courier shipped via am I, we were delivering some stuff via, uh, courier, uh, hopefully our Brooklyn delivery will be via courier, but, uh, um, Brand himself will drop it off at your house. That's what we were doing this weekend. It was, it was a good deal. We sold so many of these things that we ran out of it. Um, the general harvest season champagne's pretty early, like, uh, August, September, um, it's kind of the harvest season, which in other areas it can be, um, can be much later. What else do we got? Um, there was a question just about Cremant and what, you know, spark, you know, so sparkling wine from other parts of France and just, I think helping people just understand, you know, again, just to sort of continue to make that point that there are lots of sparkling wines from other parts of the world and especially France. Um, the stuff you'll find from France is usually called Cremant. And there's lots of different kinds. Anything you would recommend, like if somebody's looking for something sparkling from France, it's not champagne. Um, so that means, so yeah, I think like Cremant de Jura, um, what you'll see is you'll see like Cremant from then the region. So Cremant de Bourgogne is like sparkling wine from Burgundy. Cremant de Jura is sparkling wine from the Jura. Um, I would say those are my two favorite areas because that's where you find Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, which I think, um, are the yeah like the two best grapes for for making sparkling wine so look out for jura j-u-r-a it's a little bit harder to find but those are some of my favorite uh inexpensive sparkling wines and then cremant de bourgogne is also really great and then let's um because a few questions hit this and i want to sort of end on that but we didn't put um much in the way of producers on here and i think especially the there are a couple we should point out in terms of growers that we like. So you want to talk through a few producers? Yeah, um, look definitely. So Baresh, I don't know. Can I just throw this in the Q&A? Yeah, um, in the chat. In the chat. All right. So uh, Baresh is really great. Help me out here, Chris. I'm struggling. Uh, all I'll ben. type it. Yeah, I'll type it, you say. Baresh. I'll transcribe it. Charton Taille, uh, Pierre Peters, there you go, you got Savart. It. I got this. Those are all great. Uh, good places to start. I think the Grenier is pretty good too, by the way. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what else? I think that's most of it. I mean, there were some other questions about vintages, but I think that's, that's we kind of covered most of that. There was a question I think maybe Cedric you answered about somebody whose parents have a really old bottle of Dom Perignon. So we should definitely just send that to us. We'll figure it out for you. Um, no, I think, look, I mean, one last thing I think to just point out, cause I think we didn't talk about it and it is really important is that, you know, food pairings with champagne, which the great thing about champagne is it goes with a lot of stuff. Um, and it's great to drink with almost anything, but you want to, give the people some suggestions specifically. Yeah, I think it's like, it's it's the best wine to have with food that you wouldn't 
want to pair with other wines. So like, it's really good with fried foods. It's really good with spicy food. Uh, it's really good with Asian food that has more like umami kind of flavors to it. Um, it's really well. good with anything that you're able to eat from a restaurant right now, which is, which is delivery takeout foods that you can get uh, and eat on your couch. How about that? Definitely. Um, one thing that Andrew asked, as well on champagne aging, which we, we didn't really talk about and on the Dom Perignon thing is that it does age super well. The sparkling and the little bit of sugar that's left in it, these wines can age for a super, super long time. So you can hang on to that DP for, for, for a while there. Awesome. Well, look, I think that is gonna wrap it up for us. So um, thank you guys so, so much again for joining us this week and thank you um, if you bought the book, thank you so much. If you haven't yet, um, you'll see some links there. You can find them on our site, but please support local bookstores. We had a bunch of um, bookstores from around the country participate and tell people about this today. And they've been great partners to us. So thank you to every bookstore around the country who has gotten behind this thing. We really appreciate it. Happy birthday to Cedric. Thank you again for being here with us as always. Um, we're going to keep doing this. There's a six pack that you can buy through Parcel right now. You can find it on their website, you can sign up for our newsletter, which will feature it, theinfatuation.com slash wine. Um, we answer questions via email. Just email us, wine at theinfatuation.com um, if you haven't, uh, if, you, if you didn't get an answer that you were looking for today. But um, again, thank you guys so much for being here and we will see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>